Hello everyone, this is Carlos. Welcome to the Trusted Sec Tech Brief, where we go over the news for the last week. Now, this is specific for the second week of June 2024, and I'm going to start it by going over the vulnerabilities that have been out there. And specifically, I want to make sure that you guys are aware that for each one of these different vulnerabilities, they're proof of concept code. This means that these vulnerabilities are either being exploited right now or they're going to be exploited very soon uh, massively out there uh, also i want to get you in the right mindset that if you haven't patched and one of these vulnerabilities is present in your environment my recommendation is that you start performing threat hunts specifically for iocs that attackers may take once they have gained access to those specific systems this means credential harvesting lateral movement persistence and any other that you feel are applicable to your environment the first one that we're going to cover is the php cgi augmented injection vulnerability uh, this one has the cve of 2025-77. Now, this one's a special one because it's inside of PHP itself, so it's packaged with the programming language. So this means that this vulnerability can be part of multiple packages in your environment that uh, are services that you have available, either internal or external. Now, this one's a great challenge because this means that it's kind of like a supply type of chain attack or vulnerability where you need to know what makes up the software that you're using for your multiple services. And this is very challenging. Uh, many companies actually don't have that kind of S-bomb for each one of their different products. And a lot of companies actually don't make those available. Now, thankfully, don't despair. One of the things that you can do is that most vulnerability scanners out there have checks already for this vulnerability that you can leverage to see if you're burnable or not. This means that you should be performing vulnerability scans on a more regular basis. Now, there's a POC that is right now going through the rounds at the moment of this recording in the Metasploit framework as a pull request once it is made available. I bet that it's going to be uh, used to do mass scanning out there and see who can get access to multiple systems. So I do ask you to please perform vulnerability scans across your entire perimeter, check for this vulnerability and address it. The next vulnerability that we're going to be going over is SolarWinds SurfU Directory Traversal Vulnerability, CVE 2024-28995. Now, this specific vulnerability, as I mentioned, is a traversal vulnerability. There's actually proof of concept code out there, also in the Metasploit framework and in GitHub, where attackers, the main pox, what they're doing is they're dumping the passwords of the server and then gaining access to those servers. So this means that once they use this specific vulnerability, they're going to be going after specific files in the Linux subsystem of the target host. Uh, all of the examples that I've seen go after the passwd and shadow file. Once they're able to crack those credentials, they're probably going to SSH into the servers themselves. So you need to do a proper examination of your perimeter. Are we offering that type of access out to the world? If we have SSH exposed to the internet, do we have even SSH exposed to our internal users? The next vulnerability that I want to talk about is Veeam Backup Enterprise Manager Authentication Bypass. And this is a big one. This is CVE 2024-29849. And you may go like, hey, Carlos, I, I'm not exposing my backup servers out there to the internet. And the main reason that I say that this is a big one is that if you're using a Veeam Backup Enterprise Manager and an actor has been able to gain access to your systems, he may, be, he, he may actually use this exploit to gain access to this critical service because we have to keep in mind that the backup server has access to all of the servers that it needs to back up plus the information in those servers. So this makes it a prime target for ransomware crews or anybody that wants to take destructive actions or just steal data uh, to blackmail the company because they have the crown jewels, which is the information. In addition to that, a ransomware crew that is able to gain access to this type of server, one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to destroy those backups. So recovery takes a lot longer and it forces you to kind of like pay the ransom. So yes, there's a proof of concept code, as I mentioned before for this one. The proof of concept code is actually 
in GitHub. And um, more than likely, it's going to be leveraged by many actors out there. And one of the main reasons that I think that it's going to be leveraged a lot is that a lot of companies go like, hey, I'm not exposed in this backup server, so I should probably not worry about it. So I can take a couple of months to patch it. What happens is that we don't know if the actor is still inside of there. There have been plenty of vulnerabilities like the previous ones that I covered, which are more than likely in the perimeter that may provide that initial foothold. And then they can pivot to this system, use this exploit, and then kind of like take it to a brand new level inside of your environment. So yeah, take care of those. Now, when it comes into general news, and now we're moving over away from the vulnerabilities themselves, the FBI actually recovers 7,000 lockbit keys. This is awesome. This means that many out there have, that have been affected or targeted by lockbit may be able to do recovery on all of their files. Now, for you to be able to do recovery of the files, you need to go into the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center. This is the www ic3.gov website and you and you need to uh, submit a complaint there and they're going to check if they have the decryption key for you that you can use for recovery now this keys actually come from the fbi assisting terry four servers that were used by this specific actor and i think that is great we're fighting back against ransomware crews we're raising the price we're raising that cost for them to do operations. And now uh, the next one I wanna talk about is the Snowflake data breach. This has been a long one that has been running for several weeks. One of the things that we started seeing is that initially we're not seeing a lot of action out there in terms of customers being affected. We know that somebody got in, they checked data. Sadly, it was not very well handled by Snowflake itself. They said that it wasn't an internal problem, but it was an ex-employee's credential to a test environment that then let them to gain access. So that means that nobody was doing proper inventory of all of that. So yeah, not going to go very deep into that. I'm not going to make a lot of assumptions, but let's just say that it has not been very well handled by Snowflake itself. Uh, they are just going to customers and telling them, hey, make sure that you're using multi-factor authentication because that's what they're actually abusing. A lot of customers don't have multi-factor authentication. Now, this reminds me of my conversation with Alex Hammerstrom from our compliance team we were actually talking about this in a couple of videos uh, that i published a while ago where we uh, one of the main things that he mentioned was that we should know where our data is by knowing where our data is and how critical and how important that data is we can start kind of like prioritizing what controls should we putting in place? I really love that conversation that I had with Alex. I'm going to put a link in the description for this video on that specific conversation I had with him. So you can go back to it. Uh, what we're starting to see is that actors are actually using that to their advantage in selling the data. And pretty soon we're going to start seeing a bit of blackmail. One of the first customers from Snowflake that we're seeing that have been affected is Advanced Auto Parts, where the, their data right now is available for sale in the dark web. So this is kind of like an important one where we can actually show a bit of impact. Now, another one that I want to bring up to your attention, and I know that this one's very targeted, uh, is going to be the Microsoft Console files as an initial vector of access. There's this write-up from NTT Security Holdings uh, where they go over some specific attacks that have been happening in the Asia region where actors have been actually using Microsoft console files, and they're using this feature that you can actually create a task that allows you to execute other binaries on the machine. And the specific actor in this case is using PowerShell to download an MSI and then use that MSI as its initial vector and foothold in the environment. Now, this is this one was actually new to me when I saw it. And it's one of those attack vectors as we're seeing that macros are no longer viable for many attackers. They have moved over to BHD, ISO files, and we know that those are being blocked. HTA files is staple for many years is also being affected now that Microsoft is deprecating BBScript and we're seeing them move to other 
uh, types of initial attacks. This one is not very well known. It's not very well used. So I do ask you ahead of time to be kind of like proactive and start blocking MS msc files in your emails so that way once this new technique starts getting a lot more traction you have already set up all of your defenses to prevent it from being abused in addition to that i i would say start monitoring also for process creations from the mmc.exe which is the um executable that actually opens the msc files uh, so yeah start working on those i highly recommend that and that's it for all of the news for this second week of june 2024 i hope that you guys like this tech brief and i'll see you guys on the next one remember to like and subscribe and take care